we have now studied these truly, truly messianic doctrines in chapter 1. Notice at the top of your paper, 3, 5, 6, 8, 10, 12. You can see there are a lot of them there. Now we're in what's called the upper room discourse. We're in John 13. John 13. This is the upper room discourse from 13 through 17. And um, I'm looking at one, one section of it. It be, opens, uh, this section opens with Jesus washing his disciples' feet, which we will come back to. Um, a conversation during that uh, foot washing, which wasn't to be understood literal, but rather a, a doctrinal lesson from it. It was a visual aid lesson. It wasn't about literal. Uh, Peter did understand that, that there was something here involved in a spiritual way, that it wasn't just literal be in the way they hear conversation. For example, it, just a moment, if you look um, where Peter in verse 6, at having had the foot washing, Peter, when, he, when Jesus came to Peter, uh, Peter said to him, Lord, do not wash my feet. Jesus answered and said to him, and listen, the reason why is that a master did not wash people's feet. A slave did. That's the point of it. Uh, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, uh, Jesus said, if I do not wash your feet, you have no part with me. Fellowship idea. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. Jesus said, and this, this, is, this is where we get the understanding. We're not talking about just something literal. He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. And, of course, he, he is making a reference to Judas Iscariot. Verse 11, for he knew uh, there was one who would betray him, and we'll see the betrayal unfold as this supper moves on, uh, the upper room discourse and the supper. Now, um, where I want you to focus with me tonight is where the truly, truly saying is, and that's in verse 12. And so when he had washed their feet and taken his garment and reclined at the table again, it, Earlier, you, when you read earlier in this, uh, this foot washing, they started serving. They were ready to serve dinner, and Jesus said, wait a minute, and he did this foot washing, okay? If you was at a person's house, they would probably be ready to set and eat. Somebody might say, whoa, wait a minute, let's have the blessing. Let's have prayer. Uh, so he stops it, and he does their foot wash, and this conversation starts between him and Peter. Uh, he has some statements to Peter, and then he come, now he's, he's through washing feet. Now we find out what the lesson is. This was never about just washing feet. Verse 12, so when he had washed their feet and taken his garments... And reclined at the table again. See that word again? He said to them, it's a very important question. Do you understand what I have just done to you? You say, well, we know it's not literal. He wouldn't have to ask, ask that question. Right? <laughs> yeah. If I washed your hair and asked you, do you know what I did to you? You'd say, yeah, you washed my hair. That's not the point. I didn't wash your hair. That's not the point. I didn't wash your feet. That's not the point. Do you understand what I just did to you? You call me, this is the, when they came into this, into this dinner, he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you were right. For so I am. Then he does something really interesting. He says, if I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you, all, all, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And he's not talking literal foot washing. 
Please remember that. For I gave you an example. There is a doctrinal lesson. There is a spiritual lesson in it. I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Now, don't miss this because 16 is where it's at. We know because we've seen him do this in chapter 1, chapter 3, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 8, chapter 10, chapter 12. Now we're in chapter 13. Even a slow student should be getting it. Agreed? That's a whole lot of repetition. So here he is in verse 16. Here is your lesson. Truly, truly, I say to you. Now, he's been doing this through the whole book. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave, a servant, is not greater than his master. Did he just prove that? Did he just prove that? Because the master washed their feet. And now he tells them, I want you to get, the, I want you to understand this example, right? A slave or a servant is not greater than his master. Watch this now. Here's the second part. Neither is the one who's, who, neither is one who is sent greater than the one who sends him. You understand that? He just made a spiritual analogy, didn't he? He made two. He's made two points. He took it from the natural human realm and took it into the spiritual realm. Because he's talking about, listen, he's not, listen, he is a slave to God. Not my will, what I will be done, right? Do you realize this? This, we are one, we are one day from the crucifixion. We are one day. <clears throat> let's see, where was I? Truly, truly, I say to you, okay. If you know these things, see, that's what he, he started out with a question. Do you know? Do you just under, do you understand what I just did? Now he comes back to that. He said, if you know these things, you are blessed. That's a status. He didn't say you'd be a blessing. He said you would be blessed. Didn't say you'd be a blessing. He said you would be blessed. See, that's, listen, and, and they're familiar with that because in Matthew 5, he went through what is called the Beatitudes. Remember that? They called them Beatitudes because they're blessed. Blessed, blessed, blessed. You remember, you remember that? In Matthew 5, yeah. All right. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. You know what's interesting? I'm going to show this in a minute. But in the Greek language, you have four different kinds of ifs. Well, in the English, you have to talk a lot to figure out what, what your if is. But in Greek language, as soon as they declared it, you know what it is. Now, let me tell you, there's four, and two of the four are in this verse. Because the first if is a first-class condition, it means it's true. And the second if is a third-class condition, it means it's, pro it's a probability based on volition. Here's what he said. He said, if you know these things, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. See what he just did? If you have this truth in your soul where it can be applied in your life, you have reached the status of blessed. You know, in the South, there, a common saying, isn't there, when somebody wants to make a contact with you, a believer makes, wants to make a contact with you in a secret handshake, they do it verbally by saying blessed, right? Have a blessed Day. It's kind of like a code word. It's kind of like the fish symbol was in the early church. I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. 
And that goes on to another subject. I only want to go to verse 17, okay? That's all, that's all I want to do. That. Let's have a word of prayer. We're going to talk about, notice my subject. Notice the title, Servants of God's Love. If you learn nothing else, this is what you should know. The question, do you, do you know, do you understand what I've just done to you? If you walk away here and you don't understand that he was talking about becoming servants of God's love, then you've missed my lesson. So I'm going to try to catch you up front because I'm going to explain that. Let's pray. I give you a moment of silence of the believer priest indwelt by the Holy Spirit. This is the power of sanctification in your life. Etiquette, classroom etiquette, is you must be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You cannot study the Bible in carnality. How do I know there's carnality in my life? Personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be overt sins. It could be uh, sins of the tongue. These would be three categories to examine. If you're aware of anything, and you will when the Holy Spirit points it out to you, then you first John 1, 9, you confess it. You do it through your priesthood of 1 Peter 2, and you do it in silence, and you do it to the Lord. If, and here's the promise. If you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. This restores you to the power of sanctification where the Holy Spirit has access to teach you the truth of the Word of God today, something that could transform your life of thinking and living. So I give you that moment. This is true for those who are with us on the Internet as well. We expect this from you in this hour. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way to study with us today, both by automobile and by Internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would teach us how to be servants of God's love. We are not above the person we are serving. We are actually beneath them because of the one who has sent us. We're to be a servant of God's love, not a master of it, a servant of it. This was the illustration of the foot washing. This is what's brought out in the verily, verily, I say to you. I pray we would see it all today in Jesus' name. Amen. The practical application for our life today is not to go around and wash everybody's feet. Because it might make us arrogant, not humble. Depends how our tips went. We might make a career out of it. This is not the point. Not the point at all of this lesson. The point of this lesson is that we must, we must be servants of God's love. We must treat all people the same way. We're, we've been sent from God to be servants of his love. We're not superior to anybody's need for that love. And so this is a great point. Let me also say the upper room, which is John 13 through 17, we're going to have seven of these. Seven of these sayings are going to be in the upper room. I mean, that's, that's, that's as we might say where I came from, that's getting it. I mean, that's really getting after it. There are seven of them, and I listed. We got one in John 13, uh, 13 chapter, verse 16, 20, 21, 38. We got four of them in 13. Then we've got one in verse 14. Then we got two in verse in uh, chapter 16. This is, that's a whole lot of stuff in there. That's a whole lot of stuff. In fact, the upper room is, is kind of interesting because it's one of those things that's mentioned by all four Gospels. It's me mentioned in Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and here we are. You can see when they, there's a chapter, a few verses in every Matthew 26 and a few verses, Luke, Mark and Luke. But look, John took chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Who do you think covered it? Really covered it. <laughs> you understand? So if you really want to see the upper room and all the dynamics of it, you read John's account while it is recorded in all of them. Uh, also, this upper room discourse occurs the day before the Passover. 
this, uh, in the evening. We, uh, we find this as it opens up in the 13th chapter, verse 1. There's a correction to be made on your paper. I looked over my notes today and went, whoa. Um, 18, you want verses 28 and 39, if you're interested in it. And then uh, you might add in the 19th chapter, not only 31, but 14 as well. And here's what we have from the upper room discourse. Because this is about the Paschal Lamb. And Jesus, Jesus is going to be the Paschal Lamb on the 14th of Niacin. He's going to be the Passover. And therefore, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul sees this clearly. Paul understood this clearly when he called Christ the Passover Lamb. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Our lesson today is going to look four aspects of the doctrine that's in this, that comes from this foot washing illustration. Four points. And I hope you see the servants of, we are servants of God's love. The first point is that the upper room opens with the visual aid of the foot washing of the, of the disciples by Jesus to teach them the truly, truly doctrine uh, that is in our subject matter today about being servants of God's love. What I thought was interesting is verse 3. If you look at chapter 13, verse 3, it shows the motivation behind the foot washing. What, what motivated Jesus to do this? Well, he, we've looked ahead and saw what the purpose, but listen to what verse 3 says. Jesus knowing, that's oida. That's a perfect tense word. That's oida. And, and this, is, that, that, this is that concrete, absolute understanding of something. There, there, there are no variables. This is it. That's the way to. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. He does the foot washing and starts giving these great messianic things because he's headed to the cross. This, I mean, his hour is, has come. His hour has come. And he knows it. We've already seen that. He was aware. My hour is coming. My hour has come. I mean, John records that quite a bit. But what John does is John gives us a motivation what, what motivated Christ to do what he's going to do in the upper room, period, but especially in the foot washing. So th I think that's important. We also know from st previous study of John 13 that this occurred in the evening. This was an evening meal that was in the process of being served when Jesus says, wait a minute, just wait a minute, and he does this foot washing of his disciples. Because as soon as it's over, they resume, they resume the meal. Okay? So this is kind of important. During the foot washing, this conversation between Jesus and Peter took place about why you're washing feet. And there was a doctrinal lesson behind it that was to be learned. Peter saw it about feet washing and bath. Why, why, why are we doing that? I mean, if you're going to then wash my, you know, wash my back and, and Jesus says, look, there's a difference between washing your hands and your feet and taking a whole bath. I'm not talking, this, this exercise is not about being saved, so to speak. He said, there's one in our group that's not. The rest of you have had your bath. You're Okay. But you need your feet washed. You need your feet washed. And there's a lesson behind it. There's a lesson behind it. And that is the servant is not greater than his master. And you must have a servant's heart, not a master's heart. There is one Lord of the church. And he washes your feet. He is the servant of love. He wants you to be a servant of love. We all want to be big chiefs. 
The truth of the matter is there's none of us, including myself, that are a big chief. We have a big chief. He's sitting at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. He's the chief shepherd. He is the master and the great teacher. The rest of us are disciples, and the rest of us have a lesson to be learned. Would you agree with that? Well, it's okay. Here's the doctrinal point that he gives in, ver in, in this. The doctrinal, what is the doctrinal point? Not the doctrinal lesson. What's the doctrinal point? Before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that word that is hina. It sets up, it sets up a purpose clause. That, I can't tell you how important that is. That his hour had come, this is a motivation behind it, Jesus knowing, oida, absolute, no variables, absolutely, that his hour had come, he's about to go to the cross, that he would depart, that's your, er, that's your aorist active subjunctive that goes with the hena, the, the purpose, the divine purpose of this going on, uh, this foot washing, because it's part of a greater picture of his disciples. He's going to die, be buried, uh, and later ascend to the Father in session. He's going to leave the church in, in, in these guys' hands. <laughs> That's true for all of us. At some point, we're all going to die and leave it to somebody else. His hour, that his hour had come that he might depart out of the world to the Father. Now watch this. Here it is. Do not miss this. There's two parts to love here. Do not miss this because this is who you are. This is what his motive, this is what his doctrine is about, that we be servant of God's love. Watch these two parts. There's an A part and a B part. A part, having loved, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Not just the start, not just the middle when everything gets screwy and crazy and you start doing crazy stuff. Disciples, we don't have to have a crow crow three times to wake us up. Come on. He said, look, to the end. To the end. My hour has come. It's time for me to depart out of the world to the Father. I have loved you who were in the world, and I have loved you to the end. The end of what? If he's loved you in the world through all your activities, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. Would you agree that you've participated in? And probably the Lord, well, why are you doing that? You know better than that. But you know what? Still loves you. His love has never wavered on you. Your love has wavered on him, but his not in you. You have failed him. He's never failed you. And he never intends to. It's not based on your character. It's based on his. And it is that understanding that he wants your character to be the same way with other people. That's not so hard for you to understand, is it? To love others as you've been loved. You're loved unconditionally. That's the point, is it not? God's love is unconditional. And said, so he says in the participle, that's the function of you in the world. He says, having loved his own who were in the world. What he's trying to do is get the world out of us. Well, he can't get us out of the world yet. There's a timetable. There's a time to live and a, a time to be born, a time to live and a time to die. Ecclesiastes. So he tells us, listen, I, this is an unconditional love that I extend to you, and I expect you to extend to others. I love you. I, I love you in the world, and then I love you to the end. Isn't that good? Which I, I guess in him means there is none. Because the end here is you in the world. About to do a funeral Tuesday on that very subject. Note the two parts to love. 
There's an A part and a B part. And why are they? They're to teach us through the foot washing. They'll teach us that we're to be servants of God's love. And not a conditional love, an unconditional love. Every time you put a condition on your love, you've become a master and God has called you to be a servant. He's called you and I to be servants of God's love. Jesus was a servant. Look, at John 3, 16, you all know, that talks about God's love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know that. Uh, so that they could become involved with him to believe it, right? Here we have an example. Here we have an example in the 13th chapter. We have an example of the love of Christ to the world that we're a part of. And when we enter into Christ, we are still living in the world, and he wants you to know that your decisions, whether good or bad, doesn't affect his love for you. Do you understand that? It's important you understand that because he just gave it to you. It is a gift. You should be thankful for it. This is the month of Thanksgiving. You ought to be thankful for it. And not only that in the world, but he will love you to the end. His love will never wane or waver. You should be thankful for that this Thanksgiving. You should be thankful for it. Therefore, we understand the doctrinal point of foot washing, not the doctrinal, not the doctrinal point, not the doctrine itself, but the doctrinal point. What was the point of all this? Right? I mean, the bottom line is, what's the point? He wants us to be servants of his love, and he described what that love is. How, it's to, how, we're, how we're to be servants of it. Here's the second thing. After finishing the foot washing, Jesus resumed his position as master and teacher at the meal and introduced the very, very messianic doctrine with a question. In other words, he takes a role of a certain servant, then he steps back into his role in which he has been called, he's been gifted. This is who his call is, master teacher. And he steps back into that role as a teacher and asks him a question. We have just gone through this foot washing exercise. What do you understand that I just did for you? It's a, it's a teacher question, isn't it? That's a teacher question. They ought, to, they ought to get, everybody should get 100 because they all participated. It was a visual aid. Peter understood this. This wasn't literal. Well, the way he began to converse. Even after he got through, Jesus understood Peter doesn't really get it yet, so he asked everybody a question. He opened it up. What, what the rest of you think? What's he trying to do? He's trying to get them to think. He's trying to get them to think about spiritual matters today. That's what I'm trying to do with you today. Do you know? I love this word. It's ganasco. It's not oida. It's like Jesus knew. Jesus knowing his hour. That's not the word. No, no. This is ganasco. This is ganasco. And ganasco, and it's a present active indicative I put on your paper for those who are curious. This word ganasco, listen to me what it means. This is so important to your life. Knowing from the experience of learning. You know, for some of us, there's nothing like hands-on. They teach you all this theory and all this gobbledygook out there in the colleges, and you get a degree. Then you go out into the real world. Then you go in the real world. And that hands-on, that's a whole new education. Please tell me you know that. That's a whole new learning curve that you didn't get. You got a degree that got you in the door. <laughs> you know that but now, don't you? Well... The people who don't learn go back to school and become professors and teach it. 
the rest of you go out and make money. That's the truth. After finishing the foot wash, he resumes his position, and he introduces, it, introduces the, doctrinal, the doctrine behind it with a question. Do you know what I have done? He puts it in the perfect tense. There's a, there is a lesson, a spiritual lesson to be learned. I'm not doing this because of literal. I'm doing it because of spiritual. And he, and he says to you, which is plural, it's a date of plural, and it's the date of their advantage. It's to your advantage to know what I've just done for you because my hour has come. Now, for him, it means I'm going to die today, tomorrow. But for the rest of them, they, they don't know. They don't know after he gets arrested. They don't know after he dies. It finally clicks in their head after he was raised from the dead. Then they remembered. <laughs> That's okay. We all have the, our areas like that. We all have our days like that. Look, you know what's good about it? Listen to me. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Did he not? Did he not? And, you know, I think one of the saddest funerals he would have had to, be, had to participate in and God spared him would have been Judas. You talk about a guy who would have wept through the whole service. It would have been the weeping Jesus. We know he, he was a weeper. There were things that could touch his heart. If he'd had to done that funeral, that would have been a mess. He'd have cried through the whole thing, in my opinion. This is not about a literal foot washing or this question. This question would not have been needed to have been asked had it been literal. The answer was suggested, verse 1, has now been extended into the Messianic doctrine of verses uh, 12 through 17. When Jesus, the master, with del divine delegated authority over his servants or students, his disciples, does menial task to the servants and the students, he becomes a, an example of our messianic doctrine. He became a visual aid of what he wanted. I want you to be servants of God's love. And he tells you how he wants that love manifested, doesn't he? The way I did. <clears throat> You know, I got to thinking about this, this foot washing, why they did it in the ancient world. Most of you know why they did it in the ancient world. Uh, what they walked through. But I thought probably the most important person that I know of that's done more to physical health Hygiene and health are plumbers. Not the medical world. Plumbers. You think about that when you go home and wash your hands. They get no respect, and they're probably they've probably done more to cure diseases than any single group. Well, I don't know. That's just my opinion. My grandmother, way back in the early days of life, we had a mud room. Now it's like a fancy room. But back then, it smelled like the barn and everything else. And she believed in this concept. She believed in this concept. Well, anyhow. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater. A servant is not greater than his master. We are called, listen, I, you call yourself disciples. Listen, call yourself a servant for a while and see how that works. <laughs> I mean, you, could, you would just start dealing with the idea that you're a servant of the kingdom. Just do that for about a week. Carry that hat. Wear that hat for about a week. Then you'll find out what he's talking about. But talk about just washing everybody's feet, treating everybody as a servant of God's love. A slave is not greater. Watch the word greater. A slave is not greater 
not greater, not greater. That's an attitude. That's an attitude. Not greater is an attitude. Please tell me, you understand, we're talking about an attitude. A slave is not greater than his masters, nor is the one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. He's talking about that great chain of command. And we're, listen, no matter who you are, we're all at the bottom of the chain. <laughs> we're all at the bottom. There is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the rest of us are at the bottom of the chain. We're servants of God's love. If we're worth anything, we should be worth that. Jesus taught his disciples that humility. What is the attitude? The attitude ought to be this. The attitude of gratitude is grace orientation. The attitude of gratitude is the, is the mindset of God's grace. Why would I do that? Why would I ever submit myself? Why would, I, why would I wash the janitor's feet? Why would I wash the doorbell, why, the man at the door, the doorman? Why would I wash? Why would I? Why would I? Why would I? Because of humility. The Bible word is humility. Not thinking of yourself greater than what God wants you to have a ministry to the one. It's all about ministering to the one in need. The one in need. The attitude, not greater, you're not greater. You're not greater than anybody else, no matter what you think, if you're going to be a servant of God's love. Now, if you don't go to be a servant of God's love, and you won't, be, you won't be able to have a great ministry if you have an attitude, well, I will do some and not others. He taught them by practical application through the idea of foot washing. Mark 10, 45 is a great verse on that. You see, what's interesting is that should have been normally done when you entered the, entered the place. Nobody, everybody came in, didn't wash their feet. It should have been done, but listen, nobody took, nobody took the responsibility to be the foot washer. Whoever was the leader of the group, whoever was the three top disciples, whoever was the person responsible to get everybody to the location at a specific time for an, expect, for an event, whoever that was that was in leadership position, missed it. I'm worth their own feet. I wasn't called to wash feet. So he nipped it in the bud, didn't he? Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which come upon me through the plot of the Jews. Acts 20, 13. You know, you know what this humility is? It's an attitude of gratitude. It, 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 it works all from the mindset, not my will, but thy will be done. It puts you in a servant's mentality with God to start with. Now, See, you got to have that, not my will. As soon as it's my will over his will, this whole, this whole service is out, out to lunch. Not literally, but figuratively. Three stages. Three stages to reach and maintain his spiritual maturity. In Colossians, the third chapter, 12 through 17, when you go home, you read this. He's going to give you the virtues. He tells you, put on the divine virtues of you. And when you look at the list of eight, one of them, one of them is humility. You're not going to reach that status of spiritual mature believer where God can do great things through your life until you understand some of the things that God expects from you. One of the things he expects from you is humility. And, and listen, it's not how you view yourself, it's how you view other people. You might look at yourself superior to others, you might look at yourself inferior, both of them are unacceptable. 
I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in the kingdom, how you view yourself in Christ. If you view yourself in Christ, you view yourself as a servant of God's love to all mankind. Paul tries to teach that. He tries to teach it when he says in the church there are, there are no Jews or Gentiles, males or females. There's, there's no social classes. There, there's none of this in the church. We, are, we have equality in Christ. There, no one's better than the other. Now he tells you take that attitude and take it to the world. Be a servant of God's love. You've, been a, you've experienced it. Take it to others who haven't. And listen. There's a good reason why the Bible talks a great deal about love and how it conquers all. Love conquers all. You know what? You know, Coca-Cola, Jesus told it before Coca-Cola what the world needs now. Man, Jesus has been hollering that ever since day one. The church should be, that should have been a motto of the church. The peace of Christ, it's mentioned again. We'll see in, in Colossians, when you read Colossians in the third chapter, verse 15, he's going to tell you that the peace of Christ arbitrates. I love that idea. We talk about the peace of Christ. He says the peace of Christ, when you have the peace of Christ, the peace of Christ arbitrates or is, a great, is the thing that is the great factor of deciding all matters in your life. You should have the peace of God before you try to resolve a conflict. Not after. When you're doing it after, it's not a grace principle. It's a work principle. You're looking for some benefit from it. This doesn't ask any benefit from it. It asks to, it, listen, I'm giving what I've gotten. You know, we have a way today of saying, passing it forward. I'm passing it forward. And then in the Colossians, in the third chapter, 16 and 17, he says that the word of Christ indwells you richly. Do you realize... When you take in the word of God and it begins to 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, it begins to inhale and exhale in your life and transformation goes on and you can look at yourself and you can see, wow, I'm not who I was yesterday. I'm not who I was a week ago. I'm not who I was a month ago. You know what you got? You got transformation going on. And when you don't have transformation going on, it's because you're not into the word of God where you ought to be. You're not into it, and it's not into you. And when that begins to be a natural flow in your life, you're going to see transformation. Attitudes change. Decisions change. Expectations change in compatibility with the word of God. Then you will experience the word of God dwelling richly richly, richly. Jesus said, listen, when the word of God works in your life, the, there ought to be blessings coming to your life, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. I mean, you're looking for the fold, aren't you? I'd take one today. Give me, give me 1%. You can run the scale on me. You don't have to jump to 30. Jump to 5. I'm just looking for God to be active in my life. He will be active, though when the word works in you, you will find that it works richly in you. That's the, that's the richly is the top, top today is the top of the, um, what, what are we debating right now? Well, anyhow, taxes. You know, everybody looks, everybody, everybody would like to be at the very rich, but now we just attack them because we can't stand anybody to make, to make it on their own anymore. It's, it's, it's unacceptable. You have to make it with the government's help. You can't make it on your own. No, 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 no. We can't have any system that does that. No, we're, we're crazy. But see, God runs a whole different system, and, and you need to be part of that. 
Jesus' foot washing lesson today was not about a literal foot washing. You need to answer the question within your heart, do you know what he was teaching you by this? And if you do, then you will learn this. Be a humble servant of God's love. And it'll make two people happy. The Lord and the person you served. And that should be enough. Let us pray. You can do the fourth point on your own. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today to remind us, those of us have heard this before, to remind us that we, are, we have been called to be servants of God's love to all people. We need to take our censorship off from us, our prejudice, and set them aside. And it's not just giving them $5 to get rid of them. It's giving them the word of God to bring them in, to bring them into our fellowship, to bring them into our training, to bring them into the fullness of Christ. Sometimes we think we're a servant of God's love because we give them something that is not Christ, not the gospel, not, not, not what will take them into spiritual growth maturity because we think we've been a servant of God if we just get them out of the way. Give them something to get them out of the way. That is not. It's about putting it there in such a way that we embrace them. We embrace them with God's love. We embrace them with God's love. We wash their feet. We wash their feet. We don't give them five dollars to wash their own. We wash their feet. We give them the love that's been given to us sacrificially, honorably, and gracefully. Our purpose is to bring them into the kingdom, not to keep them out. For we've made this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.